Hi, Jim here. Welcome back to NGB Ideas. This podcast is about the journey of leaders, innovators, and disruptors in Canada's life sciences community, and it's brought to you by LabOccupier.com. Scott Phillips is the founder and CEO of Starfish Medical in Victoria, B.C. He grew up in the suburbs of Vancouver, and travel, adventure, a love of the outdoors, and a strong desire to help are themes that define his life. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the NGB Ideas podcast. I appreciate you making the time to join us today. Thanks so much, Jim. Nice to be here. You and I met last August when I was in Victoria to hike the West Coast Trail. And if any of our listeners are thinking about doing this hike, I highly recommend it. The scenery is spectacular, but I would also recommend training for it because it is not for the faint of heart. I would appreciate taking a few minutes to talk about your early years. You and your siblings were born and raised in Sawasan in the Vancouver area. How many, how many siblings do you have? Got a younger brother and a younger sister. I was born in the mid-60s in the Vancouver General Hospital. Then our family moved. I was in Edmonton for a little while. My father was a doctor. He was doing some training in Edmonton, and then we moved to Tawasin, which is the southernmost suburb of Vancouver. I understand you were quite independent when you were younger. Do you attribute this to your mother? I kind of do. I look back, I thought of myself as being very much of a self-starter. So my brother and I got into all sorts of things. We would cruise around behind all the stores, see what valuable stuff they threw away into their dumpsters. And uh, and a lot of parents would object to that sort of thing, but not my mom. Probably, maybe I was about grade seven. I hatched this plan that I would go on a multi-day independent cycling tour of the Gulf Islands. So I convinced my brother to go along. Maybe I was 11, he was nine. And we went off for a week. And I tried to imagine my own kids at that age taking off for a week and that being okay. Well, that's a great credit to my mom. There's no way that was just my own self-starting. That was, um, there must've been some encouragement. Are you sure your mom wasn't hiding in the bushes for that week? Is she... <laughs> Pretty sure she was not hiding in the bushes. Those are the days of pay phones. They had to call. We didn't even actually arrange any calling home at least once just to say everything was going okay. Times have changed. There is a fine line between adventure and trouble when you're a kid. Did you generally stay on the right side of that line? Well, I didn't die. Spent a lot of time outside. Hiking was becoming a thing. My dad got into that. He hiked the West Coast Trail in 1970. That was the kickoff of the whole thing. And then every year he would do this week or 10 day long hiking trip. That was our big adventure every summer. That's when it was a lot more difficult than it is today. Yeah, there were hardly anybody on it. That was kind of a new thing. You launched your first business when you were 12 years old. What was that? And how long did you have it? I created a custom picture framing business out of my parents downstairs. Went and took a course in picture framing and created an account with a wholesaler in Vancouver. And I remember getting my mom to drive me down to Vancouver to go into this wholesaler. And I went in that store and said that I was there in a to buy some supplies. They said, no, no, we don't sell retail. And I said, no, but I have an account. They looked at me kind of shocked, like he what? <laughs> they thought this was hilarious. So I bought all these mat board samples and all the corners from all the different the different moldings. And then after that, every couple of weeks, a truck would show up in front of our house with a bunch of parts for all my customers. How long did you have that business? Well, it's kind of an easy thing once you get the thing rolling and you know how to do it. So I actually kept doing that all the way to the end of university. So it helped finance school? Yeah. Wow. I wasn't that smart when I was that age, and I'm arguably not that smart even today. You did your first year of school at UBC, and then when you were 19, your mom put you in the car, drove you to a highway, said get out, and pointed you towards Los Angeles. What had you done? What was going on there? When I was nine, our family went to live in East Africa for a year. I always had this yearning for getting out on the road and exploring the world. And my mom has been born and raised in China in the 40s. You may recall it was not a good time in China. If you think about world history, I always wanted to go traveling. And that seemed like the right time. I just actually finished two years of university. My plan was to go to the South Pacific and then to Australia and then figure it out from there. So I found the cheapest ticket I could buy was from Los Angeles to Fiji. And I had a ticket from Fiji to New Zealand. And the plan was to figure it out from there. And the cheapest way to get to L.A. was, of course, hitchhiking. That's why my mom drove me out to Highway 10, which is just outside of Tawasin, 
and leads to Highway 99 that goes to the border. I set off. A few days later, I arrived in Los Angeles. There's a bunch of adventures in that story as well. She would have preferred if I hadn't been hitchhiking to Los Angeles, but she was willing to go along with it. Wow. I'm thinking that was, what, the early 80s? That was 85-ish. You traveled in Asia, and then you came back, and you went back to UBC. Is that the case? Yeah. There was a Fiji, New Zealand, sailed to New Zealand as a crew member. I hitchhiked across Australia, up to Thailand, where I stayed on a monastery for a month doing novice monk training in Thailand, and hitchhiked across Tibet. Lots of adventures in that year. Came back in 1986. Expo 86 was going on at the time. Then I entered engineering physics school at UBC, which is like the nerdiest thing you could do, full of all these geniuses. I had to remember how to do calculus and all the stuff that I forgot how to do while I was off traveling the world. You graduated as a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Physics, and you were also thinking about philosophy at the time. At the time, when I was graduated from high school, I was very inspired about ideas and philosophies. I was really trying to decide, should it be engineering, should it be philosophy? And I thought, well, it's a bit easier to do philosophy on the side than engineering on the side. But I did manage to squeeze in a couple of philosophy courses during my studies. For those who may not be intimately familiar with what engineering physics is, me being one of them, can you tell us what it's about? Some people call it engineering science. So it's basically a study of engineering and physics together. You more or less do all those courses for an honor physics degree at the same time as you're studying engineering. The idea is you take math classes with the math students, you take electrical engineering classes with the electrical engineering students, mechanical engineering. You're dipping into all these communities and taking all their courses with the people that are only doing that. The philosophy, I would say, at least in our school, is more of a first principles approach, whereas a lot of engineering can be taught in a little bit more formulaic approach. Engineering physics, I would say, is a little bit more getting down to the underlying physics and building up from there lends itself to kind of R&D, novel devices. Was university something that came naturally? Was it a time that you enjoyed? Absolutely. It was hard. And I worked very, very hard at it. I couldn't believe I'd found this community of people that were like-minded. One of the highlights for a lot of kids when they go to university is getting out of the house. You chose UBC. Did you live on campus? Were you off campus? I actually lived in Tawasin, which is a anywhere between 40 minutes and 60 minutes away from the campus, depending on the time. I commuted in to save money so I could go traveling. Sometimes I wonder if I'd lived on campus, if that would open my eyes more on the social side of all that stuff. Those are the trade-offs that you make. Indeed. You graduated from UBC in 1989. What was your first job? Well, actually, I graduated and I had done a project designing a laser welding process for lithium batteries actually not the process, more of a diagnostic for figuring out problems with the welds. Our project won an award, and then the company offered me a job after I graduated. And that was a time when there weren't a lot of jobs going, so I always felt very fortunate to have that. I had to move out to this town called Maple Ridge, which is out in the eastern town in the Fraser Valley, and had a wonderful time learning about actual practice of engineering and the work of R&D and manufacturing and all sorts of things. Is this the time that you met your wife, Fiona? I did around that time. I'd always wanted to be involved at the Varsity Outdoors Club, which is a very active mountaineering club at UBC. And there was all sorts of passionate outdoors people there. School was just too busy. There's no way. I didn't have time. I actually stayed involved with the club for a couple of years after graduating. My future wife was doing a master's degree in physiology, and we met climbing mountains. That's pretty cool. All of our friends, actually, from that time, all married each other. Mountaineering lends itself to pretty intense relationships because you're doing things that are hard and scary for days on end. You certainly find it very quickly who you can trust. Absolutely. So you were doing contract work. You eventually married, and you settled in Victoria. So actually, there's one little missing bit there. After about three and a half years, my girlfriend had just finished her thesis for her degree So I quit my job, and we dropped off her thesis to Bindery on the way to the airport, and we flew to Ecuador to spend two years in South America climbing mountains. Wow. More adventures to be had. Good for you. Bunch of aid work in high altiplano Bolivia. Was that with a specific organization? 
I didn't go there with an organization, but I found one while it was there. It's called SESI. It's a Quebecois organization. There was a lot of rural Quebecers in there. I didn't speak English, so I basically had to learn Spanish to be able to communicate with them. My French wasn't good enough from high school. You came back to BC. Came back to Calgary. My girlfriend had actually come back before me so she could go to med school. She was studying medicine in Calgary. We met up in Guatemala where she was doing a project that next summer after her first year. And I was working my way back from uh, Brazil. Then we moved to Calgary and decided to get married. Then she graduated. So this would have been in the mid late 80s? No. I graduated in 89. I went traveling from 92 to 94. Christmas of 96, moved to Victoria. So my new wife at the time had been sent to do her residency in Victoria. You were continuing to do contract work. In 1999, you were awarded a contract to build an ultrasound imager for eyes. What is that? I had been designing most of the audio speakers at that time and had created a company and had a website and attracted a project that took some closing to do an ultrasound for eyes. At the time, LASIK surgery was kind of new, but there were some concerns about the safety of LASIK. And one of the ways you can measure where the cut is made inside your cornea is actually the ultrasound. There was a startup company out of New York that actually had developed some technology for that and wanted us to work for them. The same year you started Starfish Medical. I count the beginning of Starfish as that because that project was big enough that I needed a team of four or five people to work on it, and it couldn't be done inside the spare bedroom anymore. And when the guys from New York wanted to come visit our offices, there was no office. The idea for Starfish Medical came directly out of that contract? I guess you could say, you know, what you do when you're contracting is you contract on various things, and then maybe something starts to stick, and then you start, decide to do more. At the time, that was called Scott Phillips Engineering. It was later rebranded as Starfish. Where did the Starfish name come from? There's a longer story, but the quicker version, that Starfish have some very wonderful characteristics. One of them is that if you cut off one of their legs, it grows back. They're very resilient, so I thought that would be a good name. Plus, they're purple. The ones we have here on the West Coast, a lot of them are purple. When you draw a picture of a starfish, it kind of looks like a person. That gives you some opportunities to shape the posture of your company into your logos. Starfish is now the largest contract design services company for med tech devices in Canada, correct? Correct, right, yeah. Actually, probably one of the larger ones in North America. I'd like to focus for a bit on the startup years. How did you finance the company? Like, Was it bootstrapped out of your garage? There was some benefit that the times were not plentiful. I could bootstrap. I could basically do a deal with all these other engineers that I attracted in and say, tell you what, we're going to do a contract together. As soon as the company pays me, I'll pay you. People are okay with that. I think that would be hard to start a company on that premise now. And you were taking advantage of this new thing called the internet to get customers? Yes, that's right. I created a website, which was quite a novel thing in the mid-90s. The website would have been created in 97 or so, probably. It's almost hard for anybody, for even those of us who've been living the last 10 years of the internet, to imagine there was a time when it was basically brochures. When did you know that you were on the right path? You know, in the early days of entrepreneurship, is much more of a roller coaster. You're on that path and when it's going great, and you're not on the path when it's not going great. And they come in sequences. So there were certainly some serious ups and downs. But I always kind of believed that we were better off together than individually. Around 2004 or so, I was probably into it about four or five years, and it started to feel like it was flowing along pretty well. Little did I know the bottom was about to fall out again, but that's a whole other tale as well. You've got to be prepared for some ups and downs. The life of an entrepreneur. We'd like to take a moment to remind our listeners the NGB Ideas podcast is part of next Great Big Ideas, Canada's Life Sciences Innovation Summit. Taking place on the first Monday in October, NGBI brings together innovators, disruptors, and industry leaders from coast to coast in Canada's life sciences sector. For more information, go to nextgreatbigideas.com. You now have approximately 200 staff, 140 in Victoria? That's about right, about 140 in Victoria, actually about 70 in Toronto. Okay. Why did you open up in Toronto? Was it an acquisition? Was it a, an intentional move? We had idly thought about it, and there was a company in Toronto called Kangaroo, 
and we got in touch and he said we should join forces. Kind of decided not to proceed with that, just on the basis that I thought we were so different, it would be hard to run the company together. And then he said he'd like to sell his company to me. And then we did that transaction about 2017. Yeah, it was about 20 people. So now it's about 70 and we bought the building that it was in and took over the upstairs. So now we have 25,000 square feet of space in Toronto. And what is the focus of the Toronto operation? I mean, the goal is really geography. We want to be able to serve the Eastern market, which includes all Eastern U.S. and Canada. And there's a lot of MinTech in Eastern U.S. That was essentially the strategy, just have a Canadian base to serve the whole continent. Is your Toronto office offering similar services as your Victoria office? We have a manufacturing floor there, 10,000 square feet dedicated to the manufacturing part, and then a bunch of engineering and labs and uh, laser physics and uh, microfluidics clean room and some microfluidics prototyping. We've added a lot more biotech capacity, both in Toronto and Victoria, over the last few years. Do you have any extra lab space you'd like to lease out? <laughs> Not about it. We have now filled up our building with people and, and other stuff. We certainly do have capacity to do other people's projects at our place, but we don't have room for other people to come and work at our sites. Why do clients come to you? Has your client base changed over the years? You start off by selling to anybody that will pay you to do anything, and then it focused not only on medical after a couple of years. And then over time, as you become more successful and we build up more capacity and the project management and documentation systems and so on, we become more expensive. As we become more professional, it necessarily pushes us up into the larger projects. Often for startups, you need to have the financial backing to support a professional team to work. So what percentage of your business would be Canadian-based? About 20 to 30, depending on the year. We do a fair amount of Canadian business, and then the rest pretty much is U.S. Occasionally, we get a company in Japan or in Germany or France or something. And you're not just developing hardware. There's a software side as well. Is your business equally distributed between the two, or are there other services? The software so far, although it's growing rapidly, is still a small piece of it. We don't generally do pure software projects. We only work on generally electromechanical type devices of some kind could be pure mechanical. So the software we would do would be associated with the device. Starfish Medical tripled in size between 2013 and 2017. Yeah, we've had periods. It's a little bit episodic. There is periods where you grow 50% a year. That's not easy to do when you're in a professional services organization because you've got to find people to do all that work and then periodically discover that the systems that you're working in aren't scaling properly and they're not working anymore at the new size. You need whole new functions that you didn't have before and so on. We had to dramatically change our project management approach over that time. We had to add in HR department. We had to bulk out the finance department and all these other support roles, add in more regulatory capacity. The organization got a lot more complex to run over that period. And we've subsequently, from 2017 till now, we've at least doubled is there one path in particular above all others that has been a more concerted focus? We like anything that's sort of complex electromechanical, to be honest. So I'd say probably the biggest maturing aspect is really realizing that our job is to actually, for the startup clients, our job is to really be a partner for a lean startup journey. Everything we do is somehow enabling some sort of an experiment towards a value proposition or product market fit experiment. That's really the job of a lean startup, to figure out what their product is and who needs it and can you make it work. So we've become very expert in that journey, what those milestones are. I think of it a little bit like if you wanted to do a $100 million transaction, buy a, buy a complex company, you go hire a, a law firm to help you with that, and they know exactly what a good transaction looks like. They should be able to guide you along the way, tell you what risks to manage, what problems you typically see and what's hidden in the verbiage of what the other guys are sending over. And I like to think of us a bit like that. That's a great analogy. What are some of the devices you've helped design? Many, many devices. At any given time, we're running 30 or 40 different things through the house. For example, there was a company called Novodak that came to us. Going back a few years, it was a Toronto-based pre-revenue public company. 
that had some technology for looking at blood perfusion in skin flaps for skin surgery. That was a very rapid and intense project to try to help them get to the market. And it was more on the mechanical industrial design head project. So we were successful with that. They were able to launch on time against all odds and preserve a big distribution relationship. And they later on added some capacity within endoscopy, and then they sold the company for a billion dollars, which was the largest transaction in the history of Canadian med tech at that time. It's now it's Stryker. Stryker still has a big plant. Their R&D facility was in Vancouver, and it's still there, more successful than ever. And they've got a relatively new facility in Hamilton. Right. That they opened up a few years ago. What has been the most challenging part of building your company? You know, there's so many layers and ways that you could possibly answer that question. I think part of it is continually having to reinvent yourself and reinvent the company. You can never stand still. You're always, there's always something breaking. And you always have to be willing to take something that's been working fine, but it won't be the right next thing and break it. I find that infinitely complex and interesting. One of the hardest things for me personally was actually transitioning from being a technical expert to being a sales guy in the early days. That was kind of a big sense of loss, almost mourning, to realize that I couldn't pursue my dreams of being an outstanding engineer any farther. I had to enable other people to do that. Interestingly enough, after about six months later, I looked back on that and I thought, you know, the part of engineering I like the best is the early stage, conceiving what the problem is and what might be an appropriate approach to it. I actually like it particularly when the technical problems are mixed with situational problems and business problems, finding a solution to all of that. If I'd known the word product management, I would have realized that I was doing at that time. And I realized I liked that more than the technical engineering. You've lived the life of an entrepreneur for quite some time and have an enviable track record of success. Anyone who has gone down a similar path knows there are dark days along that path. What was the biggest setback you've encountered and how did you overcome it? There's been a number of them. I would say not even in recent years, nothing's really serious. Early on, there was a time when we were working on that ultrasound machine for eyes, and I got very involved in it, trying to help the company along, and they were struggling a little bit financially, so we're boosting them along, trying to help them get to a state where they could raise capital. And there was a time when they actually paid us in shares of a public company. That was called LASIK Vision. They were the supporters behind the scenes, the CEO of that company paid us in shares. I asked our guys what they wanted to do. I had all these shares in my trading account. Should I sell them, give them the cash, or do they want to let it roll, or what do they want to do? And so about half of them wanted to just let it roll, the other half wanted to get paid. And four months later, the company went bankrupt. And so we were left with hundreds of thousands of dollars of bad debt. Of course, we were not a big company at all at that time. We had all these bills coming in and payroll and so on and no money to do it with. And so those are pretty dark. What did you take away from that period? There's a couple of things. One is that you can find a way. If you have a sense of vision and you can animate people, you can overcome a lot of hurdles. You've got more resources than you realize. You learn that when you climb rocks as well, that a rock spits you off and you think you can't do it. And then you realize that you can get to another level and you can somehow keep going. Well, on a lighter note, what's been your biggest win? I consider a win when one of our clients does really well. I think that's one of the philosophical underpinnings of our company. You always have to ask, how big a problem are you working on? So I consider the problem we're working on is having our clients succeed with their business. Who wants to design a thing that's not going to be successful? Now we actually have a, a wall in our office. We call it the 100 by 100 wall. It's for where well, we have a plaque for every one of our clients that's worth more than $100 million, where we've had a central hand in that. You could say it's the filthy lucre, but I think it's almost like the most honest way to judge whether you're ha having an impact. Design impact, clinical impact should show up in equity value. Using that as a tool to align everybody has been super, super helpful and interesting. And the clients all, love, of course, love it when they come in and see that where our heart is, somehow punching through all the superficial things, you could optimize on the wrong thing pretty easily. But if you're thinking long-term, it'll prevent you from making big mistakes. We launched a company for handheld ophthalmic devices and ended up in a partnership with a German company. And then we sold that to another company in Buffalo. That was pretty fun too. 
the individual wins are the short term, but the long term wins are the team wins. That's absolutely right. I think of it that way. We're building something that's really exciting and culturally rewarding and that people love contributing to. And then we're enabling our clients to be successful. I think that's more of a uh, win for me than any particular technical solution. What do you like most about what you do? I like that every day I get to have about eight conversations, a little bit like this, maybe not all reminiscing on history, but that are consequential, that are meaningful for the person that I'm talking to, maybe remove an obstacle for them or help them get inspired or see a different picture than they were seeing and intuitively get to a spot that's much better. I get to have all these breakthrough moments, these aha moments. I could see that being so cool to experience and you get to do it on a daily basis. Absolutely. You're in a pretty high pressure position in a high pressure field and what do you do for fun? How do you walk away and close the door? Every year I go away for about a month and I usually I tell the people that if there's a crisis, just deal with it. And I go away out of cell phone range if I can. When our kids were small, we took them down the Yukon River for two weeks in a canoe. We cycled across France, go climb mountains. Other than that, on a shorter term basis, I like to go kayaking or I belong to a cycle club, so we go riding and I like to ride 100 kilometers usually on a Saturday morning. I will not be able to keep up with you if we ever do that. COVID affected every business and every one in Canada and around the world. How did it affect Starfish? Did doors open or close? When COVID first showed up, I think it was about March 17th, we sent everybody home, as many other companies did. First, we thought, well, what are we going to do now? We are lucky in that we're a services firm and we sell design services. We don't actually have to see our clients all the time. And we're remote almost all of our clients already. So we were already very good at a bunch of things that COVID kind of forced. How do you do work when your client's 3,000 kilometers away in Los Angeles or and how do you have team meetings when your team is not all together and so on? But if you can't travel, how do you get new work? And if the companies aren't doing work, then how do you get customers? And about that time, the federal government said, we need ventilators. There are no ventilators being made in Canada. What are we going to do? All these borders are slamming down all over the world. Justin Trudeau went on TV in one of his nightly addresses and said, we're engaging with Starfish Medical to design ventilators which was not strictly true. We weren't actually at that time contracted, but we had been in discussion about designing a custom ventilator just for the circumstance. And so we actually did end up getting a contract, which was a huge push, not a low risk or a small piece of equipment. It's very complex, very high risk. And it took us about 10 months or so to design a ventilator all the way through till we could actually make it, which would normally be five years. We partnered with a company in Toronto, Celestica, to contract manufacturing. Of course, by the time we were ready to make them in early 2021, then the federal government said, well, maybe we don't quite need as many as we thought. 2020 was a giant push. And during that year, we realized that we had to keep other work going, that companies were getting okay with contracting work to companies like us they'd never even met. That had never happened before. In some ways, both that giant federal project and then also the just general behavior change enables a company like us that's more remote from its market. Although there are a lot of negative aspects of COVID, broadly, we actually grew during COVID as a company. I recognize that I'm speaking with someone who has a, an avid passion for the outdoors, rock climbing, and the, the question I'm about to ask might reflect your personal pursuits rather than your professional, but What's the best piece of advice that you've been given? Like, make sure you tie off? <laughs> <laughs> make sure you tie off. You always put a knot in the end of your rope. I remember when I was talking to my father one time when I was in university, and I was wondering if I was going to be able to get a job and so on. He says, well, if you're good, there's always room for you. It's interesting how many times that's come back to me in the darker days when you're wondering, just have to play a big enough game, and then you can make space. That is great advice. When you think about your journey to date, what are you most proud of and why? I think being able to charge a course for us, invent our way into a new thing. We weren't really copying anybody. We were making it up as we went, hoping we could learn. Probably the company itself. I'm proud to have created and influenced the formation of a culture. People are very proud and passionate about what they do. 
and we can work at the cutting edge of technology with a head office in a city that's becoming known for technology, but at the time was pretty much an outpost and do something pretty remarkable here. And you absolutely have. What are the next goals for Starfish Medical? We always have lots of goals, of course. We're building out our biotech footprint and adding capacity. We've been running conferences for our industry to inspire and inform medtech entrepreneurship in Toronto and Vancouver. This year, we're doing our first show in a few months in Orange County in Southern California. So that's going right into the heart of a big chunk of competition and industry. So I like playing a game like that. We're going to keep doing a great job and keep developing. We're going to spin out some more companies. We're going to build some more things. Business is fun, right? You've got to have enough of a buffer so you can make it fun. I don't know what's going to happen, what's going to show up tomorrow, what email will show up, what new relationship that's going to transform everything. I don't know, but something will, I guarantee it. The theme of this podcast is next great big ideas. What is the next great big idea on your horizon? I think that we're going to build a whole group of companies, essentially becoming our own little private equity company. So we see having about 10 companies, becoming very expert at that, buying assets, building them up, building teams. That's broadly the next big idea. I look forward to reading front page news on the report on business about the next project. This has been great. I really enjoyed learning more about who Scott Phillips is and more about Starfish. And thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. What could be more fun than talking about yourself for an hour or so? That was Scott Phillips, CEO of Starfish Medical in Victoria, BC. You can learn more about the team at Starfish by visiting starfishmedical.com. This podcast is part of Next Great Big Ideas, Canada's Life Sciences Innovation Summit that's taking place this October in Hamilton, Ontario. For details on this in-person event, please go to nextgreatbigideas.com. The NGB Ideas podcast is brought to you by LabOccupier.com, and this week's episode was researched and produced by Tisha Prasad. If you'd like to follow me on social media, I am at LabOccupier, and you can reach me by email at jwilson at leonard, that's L-E-N-N-A-R-D, dot com. Thank you for joining us this week. If you like our podcast, please subscribe to be notified of future episodes. We appreciate your feedback and welcome suggestions on future guests. We also encourage you to share your thoughts about us on social media with the hashtag NGBIdeas. Thanks again for listening. 